so this topic of consciousness of healing it sort of is a uh, tied into the class that we will be starting on Tuesday for those that are wanting to take that but it's really the idea of how do we create a consciousness that facilitates healing automatically to go not just when we're in an emergency situation or a crisis or a difficult situation but how do we generate the kind of consciousness that constantly keeps us in a place of health of vitality of anything that you were you're seeking in your life whether it's relationships or you know uh, loving relationships or wealth or whatever it is how do we stay in that place get there and stay there and that's really what we're we're talking about and that's what the class is about because this teaching is ultimately about we say we don't teach what to think so much as we teach how to think and how we think on an ongoing basis every day what Dr. Holmes called our patterns of thought or our thought atmosphere is what determines our experience of life it what determines what we will accept and what we what we will not accept in terms of what the world presents us when this teaching began and the, the all the new thought teachings that arose out of a couple of threads back in the 19th century one was the transcendentalist movement the, the movement that uh, kind of came through folks like Emerson and Thoreau and some others who were looking at carrying what what a philosophy known as the perennial philosophy forward into the United States and the other side of it was the spiritual healing movement that had been going on for some time that was very very much a part of the American landscape in the in the 1800s partly because or mainly because the state of the medical profession was not very good you know they didn't know a lot and um, many of the great medical discoveries were yet to happen so going to the doctor was a very much a hit or miss proposition so the idea of mental and spiritual healing became obviously very attractive they still are attractive although what happened since the medical profession got better at what they do is people began to kind of give up their sense of I need to be on the ball about myself I now have experts that will tell me what to do and how to live and what you know what to what to take and that's worked in a, in, a, in a significant way our life expectancy has almost doubled in that time and uh, people are generally healthier but now we're seeing there are limits to that way of of looking at things you know and uh, there's a lot of confusion out there what should we be doing you know what what uh, what should we be do, what should we be eating who should, what kind of treatment should we look for if we get ill or if we you know get injured or something like that there's a lot of uh, lack of trust that's evolving you can see it if you go on Facebook you know you get all the, a lot of medical advice on Facebook you know the 12 foods you should never eat and then the next entry is the 12 foods you should always eat and then the sometimes there's the same foods <laughs> you know and and the latest miracle cure and and you know that that there are cures for cancer that they're keeping away from us and there's there's this whole kind of an aura built around creating mistrust I don't know if that was the intention of it but that's what's happened to a large extent and the idea of spiritual healing now one of the problems we found with that is back in the day when people knew they didn't know much about medicine and nutrition they may have found it easier to accept the idea that spiritual healing was something that could happen as people got more sophisticated in their knowledge all of a sudden it seemed to get harder to use spiritual healing to you to think your way into a condition of wellness because part of the conditioning of understanding the the scientific approach to medicine was you had to turn over all your ideas to that level of being that scientific approach which is a wonderful approach but it it's not the only approach it's a limited approach so quite often we see today and on a, a, another big shift that's happened in our teaching back when dr holmes was starting out in the 20s and so forth uh, almost all of the requests for prayer treatment were for physical healing today it's very limited number of folks are coming to our practitioners for physical healing it's more about relationships and finances and stuff like that 
So the psychological element has become more of what we look to quite often this, this, this teaching for, you know, teach me how to get rich, you know, which is a good thing, nothing wrong with that, especially if you tithe. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look, let's look at this idea. Dr. Robert Bitzer was the first minister of a religious science church. It was the church in Hollywood that was the first one opened back in 1931. And he, he, was, he was the pastor of that church for 65 years until 1996. Um, so he had pretty good health. He said, disease is neither person, place, nor thing. It is a thought wave. Disease is neither person, place, nor thing. It is a thought wave. Now, this isn't to say it's not, that disease isn't real, that if you have a disease, anything from a cold to cancer, that it's not there. But what it is saying is there's a deeper understanding that we need to arrive at that says what is there is essentially a projection of consciousness. It's a projection of what we, at, at the deepest levels of our being, see as real and true. So what appears to be wrong is just the wrong arrangement of what is right. What does that mean? Well, what it has to do with is the idea that nothing needs to be fixed. Something needs to be understood at a deeper and more true level. Because if you have the d a disease like cancer, the structures of that are the same structures that would exist in a healthy body. They're atoms and so forth, m you know, molecules. The question is, who decides how those atoms and molecules are arranged? Because it's the arrangement of them that gives you the effect of either health or illness. It's all the same stuff. Now what we know, and, and actually science is, is actually leading the way in this, is what the, what the mystics have been saying for years, is that molecules obey consciousness. That the way you think, the way you come to accept on, on the subconscious level what is so, has a huge impact on how the molecules in your being arrange themselves. And if I believe, you know, people say, well, gee, what am I supposed to believe? I don't know. Um, let me ask you a question. Anyone here ever take cold medicine? Do you buy it before you get a cold? Now, mo a lot of people do, right? That, as a matter of fact, the commercials tell you to. It's cold and flu season. You better stock up, you know, on your whatever you get. I, I like NyQuil, even if I'm not sick. <laughs> you know, back in the old days, you could get co cocaine and stuff, you know, now that... Uh, but anyway... It's another topic. <laughs> but why, why do you get it in advance? Because you believe that the illness, the cold, the viral, the cold virus, is an independent operator that has a mind of its own, and that if, if it decides to invade you, you better have some medicine handy. And that's a, that's a worldview, that's a, that's a concept you know, that, that, that's fairly widespread. But what if that isn't so? What if the only way that you can get a cold is to, that you somehow, through thought processes and emotional experiences, depress, become depressed at some level, and depress your immune system so that those little viral things that would normally get zapped by your immune system get by, get in? and have that effect. And what if part of the reason that that can occur within you is because you believe that you need to buy the cold medicine because you're going to get the cold anyway? Now I'm not saying don't buy the cold medicine. I'm saying examine what you believe and be very clear about it. 
Another thing that tends to happen when you see something like this, this, this kind of a statement is, well, if I get sick, there must be something wrong with my consciousness. I'm to blame. You know. Now, it's not, it's not about blame. It has nothing to do with blame. What is it about is recognizing that nothing happens to me that I don't have some kind of a receptivity for. And let me try to explain that in scientific terms. You are energy. You get that, right? Every, every particle of your being is energy. Every atom, okay? You know, we, we know atoms are not really solid. They're, they're just these quantum things where things leap all over the place, and they can't, we don't really understand what's going on, but you're like a 25 trillion little clouds of electricity and chemicals that are continually exploding, disappearing, and reappearing that come together, and at the level of our senses, you look like you. Okay, you don't look anything like you at the subatomic level. All those things come together, and they're held together by some kind of an intelligence, even though they're not held together 100% because you're always scattering your atoms as you go, and you're collecting new ones all the time. Okay, look at the person next to you. You're sharing atoms with them right now. It's very intimate. Say, thank you for the atoms. Here's some of mine. Right? But that's really what's going on. You're sharing them with whoever sat in the chair last. <laughs> you know? And that's just the way it works. So yet somehow you get all these new atoms and you shed a bunch of atoms and you're still you at the end of the day. Which I think is magnificent. Some of you may find that depressing. So, so we're all energy. The way energy works is it either attracts or repels complementary forms of energy because everything's energy. So, in other words, you ever take two magnets, you know, you take two magnets and you have a positive and a negative side, and if you put both positive sides together, what happens? They pull apart. They repel automatically. If you turn one of them around and you have now positive, negative, what happens? They attract. Okay. Now... That's just the nature of that, 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 that's magnetism, magnetic en energy. But you're, all of the atoms and molecules, which are made up of atoms, you know, two, one, two or more atoms is a molecule, they get into certain shapes and they tend to attract or repel other molecules of other shapes, just like the magnet does. And the only way that magnet attracts or repels is based upon the complementary nature of itself and the other energy. Now, the difference between you as a, as a conglomerate of all of these particles and a magnet is that you have an overarching intelligence that can have an effect on what you're receptive to. You effectively decide by what we call your consciousness, which is the collection of all the beliefs you have about yourself and the world that are subconscious. You're not directly aware of them, but they're created by your thoughts throughout your life. And whatever is produced in your physical being is a combination of a couple of things. The most important being your own thought projections, <laughs> your own beliefs, and you've got DNA you inherited. And you've also, you're also in an environment that will have an effect on you. Okay, so, you know, I may, be, I may be susceptible to a horrible disease that's only going to be transmitted in a part of the world that I don't live in. So I'm not going to catch that disease, even though I have a, I have a, a proclivity toward it. You see, so I, have, so I have to be in the environment where something is. And I have to have a receptivity to it. it. But if I'm in the environment where the thing is and I don't have a receptivity to it, it won't affect me. Does that make sense? Okay. No, you're not sure. Okay. <laughs> so it's a combination of the consciousness I create 
and the environment I find myself in and my genetic structure. Now, here's an interesting thing. Recent research, actually going back almost 40 years now, has proven that your consciousness, the way you think and feel, changes your DNA and determines which genes within your DNA are switched on or switched off. So that makes your genetic makeup when you show up a little less, criti less important in the long run because it keeps changing based upon the consciousness you create. What it boils down to is that with very few exceptions, most of the diseases that we would get in a lifetime are created or, or are allowed in. We get them because we have a receptive field to that particular illness, whatever it is. And it might not be because we have any relationship with the illness. It might just be because we've been thinking depressing thoughts for a period of time and our whole immune system has become less effective. There's clear evidence your immune system is directly connected to your attitudes and your sense of well-being and your expectations. So a healing consciousness would be one that would be, uh, in a sense, a, ser a series of attitudes and beliefs that you say, I only expect good. that I see myself as worthy and powerful and joyful and loving, and I expect the world, the universe, to respond to me in kind. That I'm amazed when something goes wrong. Not that nothing will go wrong. Sometimes things do go wrong. But then what do you do with that? You know? Caroline May says, The soul always knows what to do to heal itself. The, cha the challenge is to silence the mind. And by what she's talking about is when something goes wrong, what do you do when you're thinking? Do you focus on the problem? Okay. Do you think about how bad it is? And how bad it's going to get worse tomorrow probably? Oh, my God, get me on WebMD. What can happen? You know? Well, can you see what that would create a field of receptivity to? Because your whole life experience is what you're receptive to. We know that because, you know, it's not like we're objective beings dealing with objective reality because we have different experiences of the same thing with different people, right? Even the same person. There's stuff in your life now that probably doesn't bother you that used to scare the hell out of you. What changed? Well, you changed what you're receptive to in regard to that. You changed your consciousness. Ernest Holmes said, if we think we can guide our brother aright while our own feet still walk in darkness, we are mistaken. We must first clarify our own vision, then we shall become as lights, lighting the way for others. But can we teach a lesson we have not learned? Can we give that which we do not possess? This speaks to where do you get your Ad medical advice or financial advice or relationship advice? Do you get it from people that have a healing consciousness? Or do you get it from people that have been stung again and again and again and they tell you how to avoid being stung rather than how to step into magnificence? You see? If the, if the interest of the one giving advice is to get you afraid of something, you might, I'd, I'd like you to install a little emergency warning system into your, into your mind right now that would, a little bell would go off and red lights would flash to say, warning, this may not be the direction we want to go in. Because fear, guess what fear does? Fear changes your vibrational energy, lowers it, and lowers your immune system. It lowers your, also, your, I would call it your intellectual immune system, and it makes you prone to dumb ideas. <laughs> Just like a virus can get in and give you a cold, a dumb idea can get in and cause you to make bad decisions. Anyone ever made a bad decision? Yeah. Yeah. But you probably blame somebody else for it, so that's okay. 
He goes on to say, to suppose so is hypocrisy, a thing to be shunned. Jesus tears the mantle of unreality from the shoulders of hypocrisy, winnowing from the soul of sham and shallowness its last shred of illusion. <laughs> we cannot see reality until our eyes are open, until the light of eternal truth has struck deeply into our own souls. And what he's saying here is you have to become your own authority but you have to do so with intelligence. See, I've got to make sure I've got the right information or the best information I can get. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes we're in a place where we're, not, we're kind of struggling and, and we're upset and life isn't working well and we're in pain. And somebody comes up and says, be your authentic self, and what comes out is anger. That's not really your authentic self. That's, your, that's the surface beneath that veneer of anger is something deeper that is pure love. That's how you can tell you're being your authentic self. You're being love and power because love without power is weakness. People that are truly loving do not get taken advantage of. People that are truly loving they do not bu abuse nor be it nor get abused. See, we've we've often been misled about what it means to be loving. We've been misled to think it means let people walk all over you. No, quite the contrary. It means be your strongest self. And your strongest self can afford to be gentle. See, that's the difference. We cannot see reality, and that reality has a capital R. That's big reality. Until our eyes are open, until the light of eternal truth is struck deeply into our own souls. How do you do that? You do that through thinking your way and feeling your way into that. Spiritual practices and affirmations and things like that. I've said before, the skill, the most essential skill for the 21st century is discernment. The ability not to know everything, but to find the best version of the information that's out there. Because there's a lot of crap out there. This is the information age, and a lot of it isn't very good. And you see what happens to people when they accept information that isn't very good. They get very afraid, they get very angry, they get very distrustful. Because they, they don't want to do the work or they're too afraid, of, they don't see themselves as having the personal authority to do the work to investigate, where am I getting my information from? Now this was going on back in the day when they first started this movement. They, you know, the, the guys were out in the wagon selling what they called snake oil. Right? These concoctions they would throw together and they come in and they say, this will cure everything from, you know, A to Z. From... Acne to zits, which is the same thing, but they would, they would trick you on that. And you know what would happen? You know what would happen? Some people would get healed with that stuff. And that healing had nothing to do with the stuff except that the person drinking it believed in it. See, that's why they call medicine, they call medicine practice, right? Because the recognition is there is no single medical treatment that is 100% effective across a whole population because each of us is an individual responding with a consciousness to whatever it is that the medical procedure is, whether it's an aspirin or a surgery. And some of that can be very, very beneficial, but some of it isn't because people don't know, you know, doctors don't know exactly what's wrong with you or who you are or how your immune system is going to react or, you know, what your individual DNA is or which, much less what your belief system is. So they work from the law of averages. We had a fellow we knew in Florida, his name was Jim Moran. In 1959, Jim Moran, who owned several car dealerships in Detroit, Michigan, was diagnosed 
with a disease, I forget what it was, that he, had, he was given six months to live. So he sold his dealerships and moved to Florida and got down there where he figured he had like three months to live. Three months later, he was still alive. So he said, well, I'll wait another month and see what happens. And another month later, he was still alive, and he felt pretty good, so he bought a, he bought a car dealership. <laughs> and then he bought another one and another one and another one, and by the time I got to know him through some mutual friends, he owned 26 car dealerships and the Toyota distributorship for the whole southeastern U.S., and he was the most prolific yachtsman in America. He had nine yachts and 180 full-time employees on his yachts. And I said, you made the most out of that six months. <laughs> he said, I just came down here to die and didn't. I said, well, what, ha what changed in you? He said, I came to care about people. His company, Moran Family Systems, is always in the top 100 companies to work for in America. Our, friend, our neighbors who work for him, one of them got cancer. He provided a corporate jet for her to fly from Fort Lauderdale to Gainesville twice a week for two years and a hotel accommodations, and her whole family could go with her if they wanted. That's what he did for his people. He said, when I, when I you know, he said, I love selling cars, but people are the main thing. He said, I didn't, wasn't that way before. I was kind of cheap and chintzy, and I was kind of hard on people. I saw people as obstacles. I said, well, you had a healing, didn't you? You got so scared of your own mortality, you had a healing. And that healing manifested in many ways. See, the healing is always in consciousness. When, when the cold goes away, you're not healed, you're cured. A healing and a cure are two different things. Healing occurs in the consciousness. And the consciousness, there are times when the consciousness can be healed and the cure doesn't occur. What if you lost a limb, like a leg, let's say? You, you could, could you ever be cured from that? No, not fully. I mean, you, they have all kinds of really nifty prosthesis today, you know. But you could be healed in terms of having a consciousness that allowed you to live a full life regardless of the absence of that physical limb. So healing can occur whether or not a cure occurs. Cures can occur without a healing because you can, be not, you can have no change in consciousness and your cold will go away in 7 to 10 days. I don't know if you've noticed. I usually do treatment in seven to ten days. It takes effect. Uh, that's my demonstration. Yeah. Right? So you can have a cure without a healing or a healing without a cure. We are complex, aren't we? You'd think it would be simpler than that. So let's look at how this works. You begin with a thought. Okay, the thought is that the thought is we want to get what we want to do in terms of creating a healing consciousness is learn to get the cause and not dwell on effect. Okay, there's cause and effect. Cause is what causes the effect. The effect is the result of the cause. That seems pretty obvious. All your physical symptoms, all your all your psychological issues, any financial issues, relationship issues are all effect. Everything in the physical universe, metaphysically speaking, is an effect of something on the invisible side. Okay, so thoughts are the first thing that happen. And thoughts, you have your conscious thoughts, and thoughts are three-dimensional. Okay, you think in language or words, you think in pictures and feeling. Okay, it, all of those together. So then the next thing is belief. Beliefs are created based on your thoughts. And see, here's where blame is always off the track. If, some, if I come up and tell you something that isn't true and you believe it, you're not believing what I told you. You're believing what you then thought about what I told you. I can't get directly into your head. Sometimes I'd like to. <laughs> it would be a lot quicker. We could have classes in one week instead of eight. But it doesn't work that way. So I say something to you like, uh, here's the 12 foods you should never eat. And you think about that. 
And then your thoughts are recorded into your subconscious and your beliefs come out of that. Maybe you agree with me, maybe you disagree with me, maybe you don't even think about it much, you know? So beliefs are all the beliefs, all the beliefs about yourself, the world, all whatever you believe. And it's true for you in the sense that you tend to experience the world and the universe according to those beliefs. And then action or form arises out of that. So we go from thought to belief to action or form. Now we can't, we've talked about this, you can't see what the beliefs are, you know what your thoughts are, you know what happens. So a good place to begin is noticing a connection. And we usually we have to do this after the fact. You know, and you say, well, I got a cold. I wasn't thinking about a cold last week. No, but did you have a couple bad days where you were kind of depressed or kind of angry or kind of upset or kind of thinking, woe is me? And maybe that could have been had the effect of lowering your immune system over the weekend and that one little viral germ that was running around in there anyway got through and got into a place where it could have that effect on you. See? So that's the, that's the creative process. Thomas Troward in The Creative Process in the Individual says, Spirit creates by self-contemplation. Therefore, what it contemplates itself as being, it becomes. That's big spirit. You are individualized spirit. Therefore, what you contemplate as the law of your being becomes the law of your being. Now, it doesn't happen until it becomes a belief. You can have a lot of thoughts that you haven't accepted as beliefs, and they're not, they would not manifest as action or form until they are accepted as beliefs. Now, what, how, does it, how does it become a belief? It gets enough energy where it becomes dominant in your subconscious. I get five colds a year, you could say. I don't, but you could say that. I used to get four. That's what I was led to believe when I was a young boy, that that's what everybody did. Everybody got for a seasonal cold every, every season and a shot of the flu somewhere in the middle. So, you know, you would just count on that like clockwork. Not everybody, but that was my experience, you know. And then, of course, the, the me medicine companies helped, you know. You know, they'd have that, that uh, aspirin uh, commercial back in the day where the guy's head is pounding, you know, and you're going, oh, God, I can even feel it. Jeez, let me go out and get some aspirin, even if I don't need it. Right? Same thing they used to sell you Captain Crunch. The same idea. So what I contemplate, in other words, what do I spend my time thinking about? Well, I like to think that I spend my time thinking about high concepts, spiritual ideas, and being you know, an awakened being, but really a lot of time I think about, damn, my finger hurts. I, I smashed my finger on the, uh, on the tray table in first class coming back from Hawaii. Now that's sad. Well, you know, <laughs> you, would you would think in first class we wouldn't have these design issues. <sighs> but I, muddle, I, I managed to make it through the flight okay. And I have this scar to show for it. <laughs> you know, now, now I could sit in first class and think about what a tragedy this was and multiply the throbbing of the pain, because it did hurt. You know, I did have to get a Band-Aid. <laughs> you know, it was a first class Band-Aid. <laughs> but I did have to get a Band-Aid. So, you know, you could say, well, gee, I could spend my time thinking, gee, you know, what, what's the matter with these people anyway who design these things, and why can't they, why did this have to happen? I'm only, only hardly ever in first class, and I have to, now it's, it's all screwed up. And then I'd forget all about that, see? And then about a week later, I wouldn't feel so good. Oh, gee. Something in my nose. Now, then I would, then memory kicks in, gee, by tomorrow it'll be down in my throat. Uh oh, the day after Tuesday will probably be in my chest. I'll take the day off and you know, then I'll be in bed for a couple of days, then I'll feel crappy for four or five more days and I'll go away. You know, because you talk you, you know how to do this and you talk yourself right into it, right? You ever do that? No, none of you. <laughs> Another good one is you get into bed and it's have trouble going to sleep. So what do you do? You look at the clock. Right? In the bed. Okay. You get into bed at, say, I get into bed at 10. Now it's 11.30, and I'm looking. So I do the math. Okay, I'm going to get up at 7. 
So that's seven and eight, seven, 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 that's seven and a half hours. If I go to sleep right now, <laughs> I'd only get seven and a half hours sleep, and that's not enough. I'm going to be like, I'm going to be really tired tomorrow. And then like an hour later, now it's 1230, and you're going, oh, wait a minute. It's not even, uh, man, that's six and a half hours, and I'm not even tired. What's the matter? I'm going to be a zombie in the morning. And then you go to sleep, and you wake up at 7, and you remember. And you look at the clock, and you count backward. God, I only got six hours sleep. So you set your eyes on droop. Your, uh, your, your cheeks on bag, and you get up and you go into the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you go, oh, God, that's terrible. <laughs> and you do your ablutions kind of halfway, and you get into work. You've had about six mugs of coffee, and you get into work, and you start to feel kind of better, you know, but you've already told about eight people how tired you are. And about 10.30, you're feeling pretty good. And you, oh, God, I told everybody I'm tired, so I better kind of keep doing that. You know? <laughs> That's the way a lot of people live their whole life, thinking they're a victim of circumstances, thinking I'm a victim of the person who designed a, a, a tray table, <clears throat> you know, who, who did that purposely so I would not enjoy my only maybe first-class experience of the year. Or... Uh, you know, it, we, and we don't even pay attention because we forget about what we thought about. And later when we get, when, when the, the consequence comes of some kind of physical response of the body, we don't know what to do with it. We don't relate it back. Holmes says, thinking of your weakness keeps the image of it before you. We cannot be too insistent on this all-important point. In treating and doing prayer treatment, we turn entirely away from the condition. That doesn't mean you ignore it all the time. It means when you're going to sit down and do your spiritual work, you turn entirely away from the condition. Never look at that which you do not want to experience. Again, this is in prayer treatment, not in everyday life. You still have to look at it but then you want to direct away from it in terms of what is the solution? What, what, it, what would it look like if I didn't have the problem? The Spirit of God is a law of elimination and obliteration to anything unlike itself. When my consciousness has within it only love and light, that is all I can experience. Anything else I'm experiencing must be connected within my consciousness or I couldn't experience it. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with me you know, it's kind of like if you, had a, if you had a race car and you put regular unleaded gas in it, the engine would miss a lot. And you might say, damn engine, what's the matter with you? Well, you're putting crappy gas in. Well, some of you are putting crappy thoughts in. You're, you're dwelling on what's wrong. You're thinking about how hard life is. You're thinking about, oh, my God, there's no hope for me in the future or in some limited way. And then you're wondering why it shows up that way. He says, always come to a complete conclusion when giving a treatment. And this is in prayer. Always feel that it is done, complete, and perfect, and give thanks for the answer. The treatment should be repeated daily until a healing takes place. If it takes five minutes, five hours, five days, or five years. The treatment must be kept up until a healing is accomplished. See, what's what we, what we, isn't one treatment enough? Well, yeah, if, if it results in the healing, it's plenty. You can stop.